Hi there. Today I thought showing you this little kit producing a fairly high voltage for very little money and a little bit of work putting it together. Oh, and a little bit of trouble figuring things out, but that's all part of the fun. It's available from lots of places, but I got mine from Banggood. And the most intriguing part for me was this nice looking transformer which really looks like it means business in that its high voltage secondary has actually been split into these individual segments which is a good thing to prevent arcing. The kit arrived in this plastic bag. We have a heatsink, the coil, a 120 ohm resistor, The PCB and a cable tie, a transistor, a switch, a diode and finally some pin headers and a screw. This is the circuit diagram on the Banggood side. Of note are the technical details, an input voltage of between 3.7 to 4.2 volts at a current of less than 2 amps to produce an output voltage of 15 kilovolts and a highly suspect current of less or equal 0.4 amps. That might be the short circuit current because 15 kilowatts and 0.4 amps means 6000 watts and a transformer the size of a 10 liter garden bucket. The arc length is 5 mm. The transformer, primary and feedback windings are shown as thick and thin, but in my case they are all absolutely identical in thickness. Anyway, let's worry about that later as there are other circuit diagrams for the same kit like this one, which at least indicates what the windings in the transformer are supposed to look like. Let's briefly discuss how this is supposed to work and for that I made this little circuit diagram. When you apply power, the NPN transistor is initially off, so no current flows from the positive through the blue primary coil to the ground, but a little current flows through the green feedback coil through the resistor and the diode into the base of the transistor. This current turns the transistor on. Now a massive current flows through the blue coil and its opposite strong magnetic field reverses the voltage on the green feedback coil and the diode prevents the large negative voltage spike from killing the transistor. The effect is however that the transistor is turned off abruptly and the magnetic field of the blue coil collapses which induces a high voltage in the secondary coil. It also induces a positive voltage in the green feedback coil which turns the transistor back on and so the cycle continues. The diode has to be a fast switching kind to prevent damage to the transistor but even with that the transistor is driven hard. When it's turned on the full current of the power supply flows through it and the few turns of the blue primary coil. Also, the breakdown of the field will cause spikes of many tens of volts across the transistor, so an average transistor won't live very long. In my kit the transistor is unmarked, but this circuit diagram shows an N50347Y. I tried to find a datasheet for that, but I was not successful. We may hope it has roughly the characteristics of a BUL7216 of similar size pin out on purpose. That one lists a maximum collector current of 3 amps with a peak of 6 amps and can handle several hundreds of volts. The diode in my kit is a UF4007 which is a 1000 volt ultra fast type. In other circuit diagrams the type is listed as FR107 which is a similar fast diode. So now that we know what to expect, let's build it. The PCB is clearly marked where everything is supposed to go and we can see a somehow misshapen larger hole in the primary side where apparently the ends of the two primary windings connect. Apparently they changed their mind on providing a power connector and one has to use the pin headers or solder wires indirectly. There are no surprises on the rear, it's all very simple. Hmm, at closer inspection of the transformer it appears the red high voltage wire has broken off from the coil during transport. Apparently for strain relief they just tried to melt it in by squashing part of the coil bobbin with a hot soldering iron 
but the red wire has somehow slipped out. I need to see if I can fix this. But looking from the other side, and the thin coil wire may actually still be attached to the red wire. So I might be in luck, only measuring will tell, but it's certainly a disaster waiting to happen. Both connections certainly need a good fix with a bit of epoxy. Until I know that the coil is alright, I use some tape to hold the wire in place. The only way to find out if the high voltage coil is alright is to see if we have conductivity. Apparently not. But then, this is the second day, which will have a relatively high resistance, certainly more than what the multimeter allows for simple conductivity tests. We need to measure proper ohms instead. Okay, about 870 ohms, so the secondary is fine after all. On to the four wires on the primary side. This looked like enamel or a lacquer isolated copper wire. This prevents the multimeter probes from making contact, but I need to be able to measure conductivity to find out which wires belong to which of the two primary coils. Some of these wire isolation coatings actually dissolve when soldering, so as a first measure I'm trying to see if that works. Unfortunately, the coating is completely unimpressed by the heat and doesn't take solder. A gas flame may work, but unfortunately I don't have any of that handy. So it's back to the old try and true method of scraping the coating off with a knife. After plenty of scraping, I found the two outside wires are connected to a coil. The meter reads 0.5 ohm, but I have not nulled it, so that value is certainly reading too high. The two inner wires are also connected, although the contact between wire and crocodile clips is still a bit shaky. 0.8 ohms, but I suspect the two coils are actually identical. So we have the two outer wires forming one primary coil and the two inner ones the other. But according to the PCB, the two inner wires will be connected to each other when soldering the transformer in. As the order is now, this would completely short out one of the coils. And I need to swap one outer and one inner lead to get the configuration of two primary coils with a connected middle tap. So this is the new lead order I will use when soldering this transformer in. I start with the transformer because getting that one right is the most trickiest part and by not having any other things soldered in yet, I can still measure which trace connects to which coil directly without having to consider effects of transistor, diode and resistor. Despite all that scraping, the wires are still quite hard to solder in. Anyway, let's test the connectivity from left to the center and from the center to the right. All is fine so far. I forgot to mention that you're supposed to tie the transformer to the PCB using the supplied cable tie, which is barely long enough, but it works as long as you don't stress the board and transformer too much. I already put the resistor and diode in. There isn't anything special about those. The next thing is the switch, but it would be a shame to waste it on this circuit. As for the power, I'm going to use half of the 6-pin headers. I have plenty of those, so I don't mind using them. I always found single pin headers hard to get in straight. So here I cut a row of three and then remove the middle one, so the outer ones are still held together. That way they are much easier to solder in straight. Instead of the switch, I use a cut off lead from the diode to form a bridge. So the module will be turned on or off by applying power and I can use the switch for other projects. The transistor will have lots of work, so I figure it might be good to add a bit of thermal paste before mounting it on the heatsink. Now all that's left is to align the legs of the transistor and those of the heatsink with the PCB holes. And then solder it in. And there you have it, all assembled and hopefully working. Well, there's only one way to find out. It certainly makes a lot of noise, but it does produce a decent sized spark.
The real reason why I got this kit is to test the high voltage scope probe I just built and probably show in another video soon. So here is the high voltage output with the bench power supply set to limit the current into the model to about 500 milliamp average which means a supply voltage of about 2 volts. The transistor can manage this without getting too hot. A peak to peak voltage of about 3 kV but a bit jittery and not the easiest signal to trigger. Let's crank up the current into the module to 1.1 amps or 3.1 volts supply voltage which you can do for a few tens of seconds before things get dangerously hot. We are now at more than 5 kV peak to peak. With hardly any current limiting, the voltage form looks relatively clean, a big pulse which is then ringing in the transformer for some time. The big pulses occur at about 6.5 kHz which is the whine you hear while the ringing happens at about 50 kHz. I can very briefly take the supply voltage from 3.1 to 4 volts and you can get an even higher voltage of about 7.5 kV. As I mentioned before, this circuit is very stressful for the transistor, which is basically connecting the sub 1 ohm primary directly to the supply voltage. Here you see the setup for making the scope images. The red meter shows the supply current and the blue the supply voltage. Because the bench power supply is set to limit the current to around 550 milliamps, the supply voltage collapsed to just below 2 volts. This produces around 3 kV on the high voltage side. But things aren't as calm as this may look. Using crest mode, we can see the maximum current drawn as a pulse momentarily before the bench power supply can compensate is about 3 times higher, 1.34 amps. Cranking the current limit to 1.1 amps increases the voltage to about 3.2 volts. This produces about 5 kV and in reality uses pulses of 2.1 amps. The transistor gets hot but can handle this for a few tens of seconds. Unfortunately I didn't record the last mode of about 4 volts where the transistor draws 3 and more amps and is in imminent danger of melting. Using just 2 volts supply to get 3 kV is more than sufficient to light an old and burned out neon tube. I hold one end on the glass and bring the metal into contact with either of the terminals. If I increase the supply voltage to 3.1 volts we get 5 kV and you may be able to see sparks when I touch the metal and there's plenty of ozone too. I accidentally touched the metal ring on the tube on the other side and it was decidedly unpleasant but not so much that I dropped the tube. But it was really just a tiny charge through the gas in the tube. so. I would still strongly advise not to touch the terminals directly. We can light even this defect tube much more efficiently by connecting both terminals to either end which you see here. 3 kV makes it bright enough. And increasing the voltage to 5 kV make it really glow. From the scope we know we can only get 7.5 kV out of this circuit safely instead of the promised 15. So what about the equally promised 5mm spark length? Well here the distance is set to 6mm and the voltage cranked up to 4V. Yes we can get 5mm and even a bit more for very short intervals. Finally can it ignite things and set things on fire apart from its transistor of course? Only one way to find out. Here the spark gap is about 3.5 mm. The target is an ordinary piece of paper. Oh yes, setting it on fire worked very nicely. And on that bright note, thanks for watching.